no shade to Barbie, but my pick for the summer's best movie is Kokomo City. I speak with its director, D. Smith. I'm Tom Powers, and this is Pure Nonfiction. Before we go further, I want to say, if you're someone who listens to podcasts with children around, maybe while you're cooking or on a family drive, thank you for bringing that exposure to young people. But this episode, there's an explicit rating for a reason. Maybe you want to listen first on your own and then decide. Kokomo City profiles four women in New York and Atlanta who are transgender sex workers. The filmmaker D. Smith gives them a safe space to share stories that are raw, hilarious, harrowing, and inspiring all at once. D. Smith had a prior career as a music producer, collaborating with Lil Wayne and other artists, but that work disappeared when she came out as transgendered. Cut off from her livelihood, she turned to making this film, directing, shooting, and editing on her own. The film opens with Leah in Decatur, Georgia, sitting on a bed, describing an experience with a sex work client that went very wrong. So just as I'm about to pull down his pants, he sits on the bed, and I'm right here in front in missionary position on my knees, like, you know, getting down, about to suck his dick, and I pull down his pants, bitch, and I notice there is a big-ass motherfucking pistol, bitch, a big-ass Glock next to him. And I gagged, like, bitch, like, honestly, this was one of the most scariest moments of my life doing sex work because I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what was going to happen. My first instinct was, bitch, grab the gun. That was my first instinct. And I know people just like, bitch, that's crazy as hell. Why would you do some shit like that? Bitch, the way that I saw it was, it's either his life or mine. So I grabbed the nigga gun and... He was like, what are you doing? What are you doing? As he's walking towards me. I click it, I click the gun, but I notice it's not going off, bitch. So I'm like, bitch, what the fuck is going on? Like, I'm just like, I'm just clicking this gun, like trying to get it to go off. Like, I'm thinking, I aimed the gun at this nigga head. Like, I was bobo. I don't know what the fuck I was thinking. The title, Kokomo City, is inspired by a 1930s song called Sissy Man Blues by Kokomo Arnold. Till I woke up this morning With my poor kind of business in my hand Lord, if you can't send me no woman Please send me some sissy man There's another Coco in the film, her name is Coco Dadal from Atlanta. She speaks about the dangers she's faced in sex work and her dreams to leave it behind. I just want to try something different. I never learned anything else in life. Like, and I just, in my mind for a long time, I just depended on catching a client, catching a client. I've been doing it all my life. Like, I don't know nothing else. I don't know nothing else. Like, all I know is escorting and I want to try to do something different. And I was like, probably with the money I was making, I, I'm like, what else could I, I thought of, I, it took years for me to even come up with this. I'm like, well, what else can I do to make the kind of money that I'm making without doing something illegal? And then I done been to jail three times from this. I done been to jail like three times. Um, the next time will be a felony. If I can find something else, another way to make my money, the way, the much, as much money as I'm making in the escort industry, I'll do it. Kokomo City premiered at the Sundance Film Festival, where it won a jury prize and the Audience Award. Coco Dadal attended the festival with the three other women in the film, but three months later, she was murdered in Atlanta. My interview with Dee Smith took place a month before that tragedy, and that's why it doesn't come up. We were meeting in Dee's hometown of Miami, where the film was screening at the Miami Film Festival. That's how we begin. We're in Miami. You grew up here. And at a pretty early age, you went to New York. Can you tell me what you were looking to do with, uh, at that time and 
<laughs> I think I was oh God, genuinely just trying to connect with what I was drawn to, which was my dreams of not being in Miami my entire life, like the rest of my family. It, I was just drawn to pursuing my, see what became my goals were really just my, my destiny. I think I, I just, it was no doubt that I needed to leave and go to New York. And when I got there, I had $20 and a huge duffel bag, you know, but it felt, it felt perfect. I felt like I was really supposed, was supposed to be there. Were you going with specific music ambitions? Or yes, did, yeah. only music. But also, my dad had pissed me off, so I was trying to get away from him. <laughs> so between <laughs> my destiny and my dad, I was in New York. So you you unlocked a music career uh, for yourself. Um, you know, can you give me a little picture of what of what that was like? Sure. Well, I grew up in church, so I, I learned to play like four instruments, um, and you know, I, I wrote my first song at 10 years old and got a standing ovation in church. And that really inspired me to really just be a musician. And um, when I got to New York, I was obviously homeless. Um, I met some people that were subway singers and they kind of took me under their wings and taught me the subway culture and the rules or the ethics of being a subway performer. And I started to make decent money. And when I was singing in the subway, I was, I don't know, um, eight months behind in rent when I finally got a place. And I was approached by uh, a young lady named Britt Morgan Sachs who was working at Sony. She had just gotten a job. She has not even officially gotten her office yet, but she had heard about me and we had lunch and she offered me my first pub deal from being a subway singer. And, uh, but gosh. It was just such a great moment being a subway singer. It was like you get paid, but it was like this immediate gratification um, and validation. You know, people pay you as they come and go. And for people to kind of make a U-turn to say, oh, God, I got to pay this performer. It was it was very encouraging. So you had a thriving career doing music and producing, uh, writing, um, and... Then, from what I understand, that changed. You, you, like you, you went from doing really well to to not doing well. What, yeah. what happened? So, um, around two thousand thirteen, I was just I. It was eating, literally eating at my soul to just be who I know I am. Um, since seven years old, I thought I would literally pray to God to just make me the woman that I know that I am. And I would sometimes cry at night and say, you know, God, I will forgive you. <laughs> so crazy. Literally, I would say these words, I will forgive you. I won't be mad anymore if you just make me a woman, make me a girl. And so 2013, I, I said, I, I have to, you know, and I was doing very well for myself as a producer. You know, I I had a lot of... Um, a lot of opportunity, a lot of phone calls being made, and I made a lot of money for labels. And when I decided to transition early 2014, I started to change my presentation and how I presented myself, and it made people very com uncomfortable. And um, and once I officially transitioned, like started taking my hormones, and I started to change, um, people stop calling. They stopped reaching out. They stopped asking for music. I stopped getting invited to all of the industry events and cool dinners and stuff like that. And literally left alone. And I lost everything because I wasn't making any money. So, um, I'm curious, was that just a total ghosting or were, were there ever conversations had no, to no conversations complete ghosting like people f literally freaked out male and female it wasn't just men which predominantly the music industry at least you know yeah predominantly is men uh ran um but the females too you know and for whatever reason 
um, they decided to abandon me as well. People stopped coming to my studio. It was just compl- it was it was chaos in my mind because it was it was just flipped upside down my my life my career and um, yeah it was just due to me identifying as transgender. You had this community. You lost this community. Did you have to find a new community? Did you find a new community? Mm, I did. But I will say that most of my friends that, um, most of my friends that I've had for 10, 15, 20 years even, they're still in my life, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, but the music industry, the music business is business, and it reminded me that these aren't your friends. These are just people that are opportunistic people and business people, is to be frank. And, you know... Years that go by, I, my circle did change, to be honest with you, and, and um, I'm grateful for that, too, because people that are in my life, they accept me, and they appreciate me for who I am, and all of that extra baggage of I don't know and that questionable, do they really like me? Do they really appreciate me, or do they really respect me? I don't deal with that. Everyone in my life, I trust. I, I believe that they're in my life for the right reason. So, from a music career, where'd you get an idea to make a film? <laughs> Desperation. <laughs> just just completely being broke, broken. Um, I mean, did you feel like the music business for a while was just closed to you? Well, I felt like I was discouraged. I wasn't inspired anymore to, like, place records, meaning, you know, pursue artists and their A&Rs to say, hey, look at me, take my record, this is great, I think this would be great for such and such, you know, um, it was, it's draining, it's draining. Here I am sleeping on, literally sleeping on floors in the East Village and sleeping on, you know, people's couches with no privacy after, you know, being nominated for Grammys and having multi-platinum plaques and uh, billboard number one. You know, it's, uh, it was uh, <laughs> traumatizing you know, to deal with the fact that this is no longer my reality. The reality is you're transgender and not everyone accepts it. So um, when I, yep, there you go. But you are the editor, so it's perfect. I forgot your question. (laughs) Uh, So I was asking about the idea for the film. Like, you know, how did you then? Oh, yeah, yeah, desperation. So I'm I'm sleeping on someone's floor that was uh, helping me, quote, unquote, helping me. Um, and shortly before the pandemic happened, I don't know, there was this thing happening in New York City. I don't know how to explain it, but I took my camera on my phone, my iPhone, and started, you know, taking pictures, photographs around the city of things that I thought were interesting, (laughs) which probably weren't interesting to most people, but I would, I would shoot them in black and white. It would just be really more or less than, it would be more or less me capturing compositions of images, more or less than the images themselves. It, was, it wasn't the subjects that I was interested in. It was just an artistic thing, just me capturing the composition um, of what I was seeing. And I would do that, and people would go, damn, you should post this. You should put this on YouTube. You should make a montage. And I was like, really? Well, damn, maybe I should do something uh, filmic and do something in motion with this, you know, viewpoint that I have. And I thought, why don't I do a documentary? And I said, well, if I'm sleeping on floors after everything that I've accomplished, I can't even imagine what other trans women that never had opportunities that I've had, what are they going through? If it was so easy for the music industry and people to just dismiss me and trivialize my my existence, my gift, what in the hell are the other trans women going through? And that inspired me to say, well, sex workers, right? That was a, that was a commonality that we had, just being overlooked and dismissed. And that's where I was inspired to do Kokomo City. When you were setting out to do this, were you 
thinking about ways you want to do this differently than maybe you've seen other films? Absolutely. No. Oh my God. That was the <laughs> easiest part. I mean, like, what did you know you didn't want to do? I did not want to shoot a trans woman sitting in front of a brick wall, sitting on a stool, talking about her trauma. I did not want that. I did not want statistics of how many trans lives were taken. Um, not that they're not important, obviously, but it's just, I think people are numb to it. They're really not acting on the reality of the loss of trans women. <clears throat> and I do know that with the black community, which inspired me to do this film, that we pay attention and we learn more through stimulation or entertainment. That's just who we are as a culture. We like to laugh and be entertained as we're learning. Um, sometimes transgender or LGBT film or content is a bit condescending and, and uh, preachy. And I didn't want that. I actually wanted Overly to make... Overly earnest, maybe. Yes, absolutely. And and expect it. It's expected to kind of have this kind of, you know... And it was like expected to kind of have this, you know, urgency and, and this sadness to it. And I just wanted to do show a different side of transgenderism, which is fun, funny and candid and open and fierce and fun. And, and sexy. I wanted to do that. And I wanted to make a film that I would want to watch. That was literally was my, my thing. Would I watch that? No. Would I watch this? Yes. And that's what I kept. Uh, so with that in mind, um, how did you pick the people to be in the film? Mm. Well, I, I found each girl except one. I found all of them on Instagram. I What I did what I did was went to some of the popular trans girls pages and I, but I sifted through the comments and I found the girls that way. And it led to one thing and led to another. One girl I found like Leah, I found her on um, YouTube randomly and I just fell in love with her personality and her transparency. Um, I was obsessed. <laughs> Honestly, it was refreshing. Um, Daniela, um, who's a genius, she, um, she was recommended to me by another girl. And of course, Daniela has done three TED Talks. She's brilliant. But when I saw her, I thought, gosh, I know there's something else there. This is not who she is. This person that's on this stage with the perfect hair, the perfect makeup, the perfect posture. This is not how we talk. This is not all that she has to offer. She's brilliant. And I wanted to test and see if she would trust me enough to just take the hair the the hair off, wipe the makeup off, right? Um and talk as you talk, as you speak with your friends, with your family, with your cousins, with your boyfriend. Give me that. Can you trust me to do that? And she did. And it 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 became quite brilliant in the film. Was she ready to go there from the get-go, or did Absolute, she need convincing? Absolutely. Nope. She didn't need convincing. She was ready. To, <laughs> she was ready. I actually kind of had to kind of, okay, whoa, hey, she's comfortable, really comfortable, and which was great. It's better to have more than none, than less, right? So, um, talk about your choice to include uh, men in this film. I, I, you know, I'm thinking of the, uh, the figure Lo, who mm -hmm. talks about being interested in a transgender woman that he's met online, mm -hmm. um, but not having followed through on a relationship uh, with her. You have other men uh, uh, speak in the film. Um, what were you looking for from their point of view? I was looking for reality because this trans women stories are not just trans women stories. It's everyone that's involved with transgender women, which are mostly men, black men, white men. And, um, th that's, I don't know why it's never been documented. That is so weird to me. The reality is, uh, trans women deal with men that cis women deal with. We're dealing with the same men. Whether cis women want to accept that reality, it is what it is. And I have the proof. The proof is in the film. I didn't want a film that outed, quote, unquote, outed men. This is not that type of movie. It's a, it's a film. And I wanted men 
and what's crazy, I never asked any of the men that are in the film to be in the film. I told them about the film and they were all just interested and compelled to be a part of it, which was very encouraging. And um, to have men represented in the film, I think is tremendously uh, important because it's reaching, it's gonna reach a lot of men and it's also giving women a new idea of what's really happening in our community. In the film, you're talking about two very stigmatized subjects. Yeah. You're talking about... Well, sex workers. Sex workers and, and transgender trans people. That's right. Um, and you're layering them in this film. You must be self-conscious that people are going to come watching this film with their own ignorance mm -hmm. and sets of prejudices and mm -hmm. project things onto the film. And sure. so, I mean, I wonder how you thought about what you're putting on screen and... Mm -hmm. um, and well, well, right yeah. there, I didn't. I didn't think about it. And that was, that was the magic of making Kokomo City. I didn't, have to, I didn't want to think about it. I, I didn't have anyone. I didn't have an agent. I didn't have a manager. I didn't have a co-producer. I, I didn't have anyone the to D, make me D second. <laughs> yes, it was D completely inspired, enforced, and, and encouraged, empowered to shoot what I initially said I want to see actually publicly. I, if I could, if I could, if I could see this on Amazon or HBO, how would I want to see it? I want to see it. Action packed doesn't mean shooting or violence. It just means just nonstop stimulation, right? And it was so refreshing and so fun. And, and I, you know, I I dare say rare. I didn't have anyone in my ear making me second guess my originally or my original idea so th there was no time to think I didn't there was no space to think and neither the girls didn't think um which which is incredible because it goes to show how much freedom and how much they wanted to be free by me doing this film by me saying hey I have this idea and I want to do this there's no money and there's no guarantees but this is what I want to do they were so willing and so tangible and accessible. And it let me know how much they wanted to just be free from their lives of, of, of sex work and um, stigmatization. It occurs to me that it's sometime in the timeline of making this, about a year and a half ago is when the Dave Chappelle uh, Netflix show came mm -hmm. out, The Closer, mm -hmm. where uh, it was very controversial for the way he was talking about mm -hmm. transgender people. And one of the things that people really took exception to is he was almost equating transgender people with white people mm -hmm. um, and seemed to be negating uh, a, you know, a black transgender uh, experience. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder how you process that. Mm -hmm. Well, to be honest, I didn't see the, I didn't see it. I didn't, um, I was busy. <laughs> sleeping on floors and trying to figure out what the hell am I doing on this floor after I've accomplished. So I've not had a lot of Netflix experiences during that time. But I, but the clips that I saw online, I, I will say, um, I, God, it's, 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 it's tricky. That I wasn't angry at anything he said. The only thing that was a little alarming concerning to me was the timing. I don't remember what it was, but there was something very intensely political about transgender people and our lives. And, and there was a lot of online bullying and um, threats to our livelihood. A lot of violence taking place. At that time, it was a lot, a very intense. Um, and I remember, why would, why would Netflix decide to release this right now. That was my only thing. N things that he was saying, I'm not I'm not going to say I was okay with, but I was it didn't bother me. Like I laughed at some of the things. And a lot of us trans women, we laugh at those very same things and this is hypocritical of us to attack um a comedian that's saying the same thing that we laugh at and 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 we say and we joke about um to attack him. But I just think timing-wise, it was it was it was hard. 
it was hard. But I have nothing against him. In the film, uh, you seem to take a kind of a deliberate approach to nudity in the film, and mm -hmm. and uh, nudity around transgender representation is often sensationalized mm -hmm. or you know played for. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, a sh uh, shock value, or uh, so. I wonder how you were thinking about nudity in, in in your representation. Well, I. It was very important that I showed that, and Dominique, who showed full frontal nudity, I, I asked her a couple days before I filmed her, before I interviewed her, and said, my intentions are to film you and to interview you, but I want this. And this is why I want this. And Dominique particularly is was a porn actor, a star, whatever have you, and she was quite popular. And she's done it for a long time. And when I asked her in the privacy of her home to, to do this, there was a little pushback. There was the only time in this entire process with all the girls that even her that I got a little pushback. She didn't say no. She was just questioning it. And I think at some point she even questioned my intent, which made me defensive and, and made me, because I just, I didn't want her to feel that way at all. But it was very important that people see true transgenderism, breast and a penis. Most of us, that's most of our anatomy. And... I want to, not that that one clip would normalize our bodies, but it's a start. It's like if cis women could do it, why can't we? We want to be normalized and we want to be humanized, but we create, we, or we allow these fortresses to be built around us that make us not human and not humanized and people are afraid to talk to us, are afraid to you know, discuss things with us. I, I wanted to kind of like shake that up a little bit. So I explained to her, wow, you know, it's interesting to me that you're able to do porn and you're comfortable with that. And there's hundreds of videos of you doing that or if you all of your private parts. But here's a trans woman as a director in your home, only us, the safest opportunity. And you're um, questioning it. That's exactly why we need to do Kokomo City even for you, because you've been taught to, to be shame, ashamed of this. So I say, okay, well, I meet you halfway to make this less sexualized for whoever, whatever freak is out there that's going to sexualize you being in your truth. L grab that sage. Let's burn the sage and make it completely spiritual and, and, and pro you know, and she did it. And that's why that, sh that, that frame was a little, sh well, a lot shaky because I was just trying to film it, get it done before she changed her mind. <laughs> <laughs> and how has she felt about it uh, now that the film is out in the world? Oh, she's so proud. And, and the last uh, panel that we had in Berlin, well, since then she's had uh, uh, sexual reassignment surgery. And um, she speaks openly about that now. I was letting her do that before I said anything. But um, she's she just handled it so well and full of dignity when someone brought that up. That was inspired by that shot. And so I, I think she's in a, 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 a good place. Like she, she definitely understands the impact that it has for people to actually see a trans woman in her complete, full self. After you've shot the film, mm -hmm. you edited yourself, mm -hmm. I assume because, uh, probably out of necessity, uh, yeah. you were uh, still working on your own. Yeah. The film is supremely well edited. Um, can you talk about what that was like? Did it, did it feel like a natural process from your work in music? It was my, it was the most fun, it was the most gratifying part of the entire process from top to bottom. I love it, editing. And I don't see how I'm going to allow anyone to edit any of my work without me. Um, but I know they're out there. Um, and you edited this on iMovie. iMovie. Yeah, <laughs> no. I did. I edited on iMovie. It was, it was um, 
you know, when I was editing, I had things in my mind that I wanted, damn, I should do this, I should do that, and I would go to iMovie and see if I had that possibility, and that possibility wasn't there. Um, but creatively, it kind of forced me or led me to do something else creatively, right? Um, so that primitive survival, you can do this, you got to do this, and it's in you, or that didn't work, I can do it. It literally was there. It was the forefront of my intuition. And I, I, I loved editing. It was challenging. But it was so fulfilling because you just, you're creating this world. You're creating this, this place for people to, to come in and out. And um, it doesn't matter if you're working on, on iMovie or Premiere. You have the power. And if you're a true creator, nothing is going to hold you back. Well, something that's striking about the editing is it's not like you're following a storyline mm -hmm. or uh, you're weaving conversations in and out of each other. Were you thinking of any examples? Do you have any examples in mind as you were approaching that? Or were you just following your own intuition? Well, I follow my own int intuition, but I've also was in greatly inspired by Tarantino. I know that probably doesn't <laughs> isn't obvious with Kokomo City, but he's one of my my favorite directors, and I I loved um, Spike Lee. So it's, it's somewhere in between that. So there's Tarantino, Spike Lee, and D Smith. So, so <laughs> I'm gonna throw myself right in between them. Um, yeah, I, I definitely see you, Tarantino, in the opening scene uh, of the film. Uh, uh, but the, but I, but it's hard for me to follow those threads to the kind of, you know, poetic rhythm that you found in this film. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm also a musician and um, a producer, so there's a sensuality to me. And a, I'm also a cancer by Zodiac, so I'm pretty sensitive. Um, there's a romance. Even though there's this raw grit to the girl's story, there's also a romance to their lives and, and the rest of society. It's like this yin-yang relationship. Um, when they were telling their stories, I just saw, I just heard beautiful music because it was beautiful to me that they were able to trust me. And the music was inspired by that process that, damn, they're, let, they're not wearing, you know, all this fancy hair. They don't have a glam squad. There's no gowns like people just expect from trans women. These girls were in their truth, super raw, in their, the privacy of their home, and they killed it. They, God, it's just like, it's just beautiful. I would, they inspired me. They inspired me for the editing, for sure. You went through this period of being kind of ostracized by the music mm -hmm. industry. Feels like now you're working your way back into uh, music. Mm -hmm. uh, you're working on a soundtrack to the, uh, to the movie uh, as we speak. It, uh, have you found that you now seven or so years after this uh, this break that people are accepting you more? Yes. Um, yes, but... Oh, God. Such a simple question, but it's the way you worded it that just... It's, um, it's still work. I still have to explain to people where I am right now. People, Most people don't know about... Kokomo City. It's just film people and, you know, and a lot has happened. A lot has changed in the eight years that I was ostracized or, you know, you know, blacklisted out of the business. A lot of progress. A lot of things have happened. And um, everything is about timing. When I talk to certain artists, I, I can't be as transparent or uh, abrasive with every artist. You know, I have to be um, mindful of who I'm talking to. So, like, for the soundtrack, you know, I just recorded CeeLo Green, and for example, and he's extremely excited from what he's heard so far, and there's a lot of other very important, uh, iconic artists that I'm also working with. And I think just being in the room with these people, 
and them knowing that, no, I'm not trying to have sex with you. I just want to make great art. And I think they're really start for as far as I'm concerned, f for me, they're, um, they're opening up. They're understanding who I am. And, you know, you have to be patient. I don't have a blueprint of how to do this. There's not <laughs> too many trans women that have done this, if any. Um, so I can't call someone, hey, how did you do this? You know, I have to just use my humanness and say, you know, what, what feels right. You know, not to downplay who I am, but just also just be a little bit more patient and understanding. So that, that's, this worked so far. We're speaking just a few weeks after the film premiered at Sundance and then shown at the Berlin Film Festival and has won awards and has uh, won great critical reviews and um, audience awards. Uh, I feel like I'm catching you as a, as a rocket at the beginning uh, of its journey. Beginning? Oh my <laughs> God, there's more? <laughs> It's only March, honey. <laughs> oh my God. The film hasn't even come out in theaters yet. Lord help me. Okay. So how are you feeling in this moment? I'm very grateful. I'm full of gratitude. And I know it sounds corny and, and expected, but there are really no words to express what I'm experiencing right now. And I just have to keep it simple and not fight it and just say what I could say. Um until better words are invented. But I'm very grateful, and I'm, but I'm also very aware that of the position that I'm in, and that is a place of um, responsibility. I wanna just keep telling great stories, rather that's narrative or documentary. Um, and not just transgender, just any filmmaker this is a rare moment this is this doesn't happen often like not everyone gets standing ovations for three to five minutes you know not everyone win oh, audience awards back to back yes you can work just as hard on a film and not get that that's right and then people have and and I was just blessed enough that the universe allowed my story and my journey to kind of cut through and I I'm grateful for that, but I'm also, I don't want to stop. I want to work. I'm trying to let it sink in. People are making a big deal about that, but have it sink it in to you. Did you, you know, I'm trying, but I've not had a moment to really do that. It's been nonstop, my phone, my emails, and uh, my mind. I'm just ready to work. I'm ready to work on, the, I'm ready to start my next project for sure. thank Dee Smith for speaking with me. Her film, Kokomo City, is distributed by Magnolia Pictures. I hope you'll subscribe to Pure Nonfiction's email newsletters. We have Producer's Notebook on the business of documentary and Editor's Notebook on storytelling. You can subscribe for free at purenonfiction.net. Thanks to our team, series producer, Hannah Norden-Swan, marketing manager, Bella Racklin, our intern, Sahai John, and web designer, Cross Strategy. Our theme music is composed by Andre Williams, and our executive producer is Raphael Nehausen. I'm Tom Powers. Follow us on Instagram at Pure Nonfiction. <laughs> <laughs>